To check out all our products, go to musicnomadcare.com. Hey, it's Ram with Music Nomad. This video is designed to show you how to set up your guitar using Music Nomad's Keep It Simple Setup Method. The KISS process uses our precision gauges and tools combined with step-by-step -step general guidelines anybody can follow and set up their guitar to play and sound great. To get the job done right, you will need our six-piece precision gauge set that includes a truss rod gauge and pick capo, string action gauge, radius gauge set, nut height gauge, and a 24-page instructional booklet. All of these uniquely designed to make the process much easier and precise than other gauges out there. The three Music Nomad tool sets are a 26-piece Guitar Tech screwdriver and wrench set, 11-piece truss rod wrench set, and a diamond coated nut file set. With these four kits, you are able to set up most all guitar and basses out there. Before you get started on your setup, there are some pre-setup steps you should do. Remove all your strings with the Music Nomad grip cutter. With the strings now off, and with the Music Nomad radius gauge, measure and make a note of the fretboard radius as you will need this info when you measure the string radius in the setup process. Tighten all screws, including the tuning machine bushings with Music Nomad's Guitar Tech tool set. Polish your frets with Music Nomad's Frying Fret Polish. Clean and condition the fretboard with Music Nomad's F1 oil. Clean the body and neck with Music Nomad cleaners. Finally, put new strings on with Music Nomad's Grip Winder. Okay, now you're ready to start the setup, featuring our talented guest guitar tech who will lead you through the process. Have fun. Hi, I'm Jeff Luttrell, owner of San Francisco Guitar Works and Sonoma County Guitar Works here today to set up this beautiful Squire Affinity Stratocaster. With the goal of making setups accessible to everyone, my collaboration with Music Nomad has resulted in the Keep It Simple setup process to help you make your guitar play and sound great. Let's get started. So to set this guitar up, we'll be using the individually adjustable saddles flow in our setup booklet. The process will go like this. The first two steps in starting your setup are going to be making sure that the guitar is tuned to pitch. So we'll do that first. This one's actually pretty close. And then secondarily, we're going to lower the pickups down. Um, these pickups in the Squire do not have magnetized pull pieces, so they're not going to be as uh, temperamental as a like an American standard Strat pickups would be, but typically a single coil uh, Strat pickup can impart a lot of magnetic pull on the strings. So you're going to want to lower these down to about the height of the pick guard and get those out of the way. So during the setup, you don't have your pickups uh, pulling the strings down, causing uh, intonation issues or undue fret buzz. The first thing that we'll do is we'll set our truss rod to achieve the proper neck relief. The next thing that we'll do is we'll set our outer two E strings to the proper height using our string action gauge. After that, we'll set our inner four strings to the proper arc using a radius gauge to match the fretboard radius. Then we move down here to the nut. We'll cut the nut slots correctly using our nut height gauge and our diamond coated nut files. We will then intonate the bridge using the uh, saddle adjustment screws to move the saddles forward and backward. And lastly, we will set our pickup heights to achieve proper uh, and even output between each pickup. First step, we're going to adjust our truss rod to get our neck relief set correctly. So we're gonna need a couple of tools for that. The first thing that we'll need is our pick capo to depress the low E string to the first fret. So I'll take my pick capo, put it over the E string, under the A, and over the D. And what that does is it just pushes down my E string at the first fret so I don't have to hold it down. Next, I will get my truss rod gauge, which is this cool little feeler gauge set that has three, uh, three feeler gauges on it. One that's six thousandths for electric guitar, one that's eight thousandths for acoustic or a bass, and then 10 thousandths for classical. Um, the gauge has a legend on the side to show you uh, which way to turn your truss rod nut depending on if your uh, neck has too much relief, too little relief, or the right amount of relief. So I'll show you how to use that. So I'll put my guitar into the playing position 
and I'm going to fret between the 12th and 13th fret. So with the pick capo pushing down at the first fret and me pushing down at the 12th, I've created a straight edge between the 12th fret and first fret. So what I'm gonna actually measure is the gap between the string and the sixth fret. I'm gonna use my 6,000th gauge because that's what I'm going to set the relief to. Um, for an electric guitar, that is a really good setting for overall uh, evenness of action up and down the fretboard and clean playability. The measurements that we use on all the gauges, the truss rod gauge, the nut height gauge, the string action gauge, those measurements were developed over years and years of doing uh, both hand fret levels, hand setups, using the Plec machine, uh, really finding out from thousands and thousands of uh, really discerning clients what types of uh, action heights, relief settings, nut heights work well for the majority of the players. So we've, uh, we've settled in on some really good starting points for a solid setup. Now, depending on your playing style, you might want to have maybe a tiny bit more relief, maybe a little higher action, uh, but the specs that we give you are going to be a really, really solid place to start. So we'll use our six thousandths gauge to set our truss rod correctly for an electric guitar. So what I'll do is I'll take that feeler gauge and I'm going to fret at the 12th fret and I'm going to push the gauge between the sixth fret and the string and I'm going to see does it have a heavy touch between the string and the gauge, meaning does it push the string out of the way? Does it have just a very light touch where it either doesn't disturb the string or you can just hear it scraping on the string? Or does it have no touch at all where there's a gap? And on this neck, what I've got is I have a little bit of a gap. So with no touch at all, I'm going to look at my gauge here and I can see with no touch, I turn my truss rod nut clockwise to tighten the truss rod and take relief out of the neck. So I want to go from the amount of space I have to less space. So I tighten the truss rod by turning it clockwise. When the gauge tells you to turn your truss rod nut clockwise or counterclockwise, just remember that means you're looking at the nut from the headstock end, not from the fretboard end. So as you put the wrench in, you're gonna look at the wrench and turn it clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on what the gauge recommends. Now I'll get into my truss rod toolkit here. I'm gonna to make an educated guess that this is a five millimeter Allen wrench. What's really cool about the Music Nomad truss rod kit is it has 11 different truss rod wrenches in it, so you can cover almost every guitar made with just a really small, convenient box of tools. Um, this is my five millimeter and Lo and behold, it is a five millimeter. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this clockwise just a little bit. And then I will flex the neck. Just I put just put a little pressure in the middle, just give the headstock a little pull just to make sure the truss rod's seated. Take it back into the playing position, fret at the 12th fret, and then I'll use my gauge here at the sixth fret. Okay, now I can hear the gauge just barely scraping against the string. So I have now got the proper six thousandths of an inch relief in the neck. So now that we've set our neck relief correctly, six thousandths of an inch, we're gonna move on to the bridge. Now there are a few things that we wanna talk about whenever it comes to a Stratocaster tremolo. So this Squire Strat has a tremolo. It's a vintage style, uh, six screw tremolo. Uh, it's very common on many, many guitars, Stratocasters most typically. Whenever you're setting up your tremolo, you have a few choices. You can leave it flat to the body or you can have it floating. And there's a range in between there. Um, if you don't ever want to use your tremolo, you just tighten up your springs in the back and I'll show you how just to keep that flat. If you want to use your tremolo a little bit, but want to keep it sitting on the body for better tuning stability, will loosen the spring so that it's easy to use, but it still stays flat to the body. So that's what I'm gonna do on this guitar. That's very common. A lot of players wanna use their tremolo, but they don't care about pulling up on it. So having the plate resting on the body is going to give you the ability to push down on the tremolo and actually change your pitch down, but you just can't pull up. Um, so I'll show you how to set that up. I usually like to have it where if you bend notes on the high strings, the tremolo doesn't move, um, but it's not 
too tight so that it makes it uncomfortable to push down. So like right now, this one is pretty hard to push down. It's got a lot of spring tension. So what I'll do is flip the guitar over, take off the back plate, and I'm gonna loosen the springs until the tremolo is easier to push down. Um, the way that this system operates is the tremolo is balanced between the claw springs and the strings. So if the claw is very tight, then the tension's gonna be very tight on the tremolo and it's hard to push it down. If the springs are very loose, the back of the tremolo will float up because the strings will be able to pull it up. So here is uh, how you access the claw and the springs. So off we go with our back plate. Put your screws in a safe spot. So this is the inside of the trim cavity. You have the, uh, the tremolo block. This is what's attached to the plate. You have your three springs. This one just happens to be three. Sometimes they'll have two, sometimes five, just depends on the amount of tension, the geometry of the tremolo, the tension of the springs. Um, this is the claw. This is what the springs are attached to. And these are the claw screws, which screw into the body. Now these screws are the screws that you'll use to adjust the claw back and forth to adjust the spring tension on the tremolo. So I want to reduce the spring tension on this tremolo so that it's more easy to use. I will back these screws out and allow the claw to move towards the block and that will loosen the spring tension. So I'll take my Phillips screwdriver and I'm gonna back these out. And I'll flip the guitar over and I'll see I'm still sitting on the, actually that just, just lifted it off the body. So I'm gonna wanna tighten those back up just a hair and bring that back down to the body. So I'll flip it back over, give it about a turn on each. The back of this tremolo is slightly lifted off the body. But I don't think that's because of the spring tension. I think that these mounting screws are too tight. It actually wedges the back of the tremolo up off the body and that can cause some real tuning stability problems because the trim isn't pivoting freely on the screws. It's actually pushed down and is not able to move freely. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen each one of these just a little bit to get it up off of the trim plate and see if that doesn't drop the back of the tremolo down to the body. And it did. So now the tremolo is resting tightly to the body and that wasn't because of spring tension, it was because the uh, pivot screws were binding the front of the tremolo. So you should ideally, if your trem is sitting flat on the body, you should see a tiny gap between the bottom of the mounting screw heads and the tremolo plate. If you don't, those screws could be binding. So now that I have the tremolo free to move, I'm gonna bend on my high E string, and I can see when I bend, it is actually lifting the back of the tremolo up. So this is a little looser than I want. Um, the thought behind this is if you play double stops where you bend against other notes, if the tremolo comes up, your notes are gonna go flat and your double stops will be out of tune. So I'm gonna tighten this back up just a little bit. Now I'll bend my high E. There we go. Now it's staying on the body when I bend the high E, but if I bend the low E, I can lift it. So I've got kind of the minimum amount of spring tension to maintain overall tuning stability. The tremble is very supple, very nice to use, but it's gonna be really good for, um, like I said, overall tuning stability um, and just uh, any kind of bending, uh, your other notes will stay in tune. Now, if you wanted to be able to pull up on the tremolo and raise the pitch of your strings, in addition to being able to push down, you would continue to loosen the claw until the back of the tremolo came up off the body. You can have it just a little bit off the body for the kind of surfy vibrato stuff, or you can have it much higher off the body to be able to raise your notes to an actual uh, 
like raise them up a half step or raise them up a step and a half, depending on what string you're talking about. So you have some options on your tremolo float. But for most players, having just, a, just enough tension to keep the trem on the body works really, really well. Now that we have our neck relief setting correct, uh, and we have set our tremolo flat to the body, but with minimal spring tension so that it's nice and supple and easy to use. I'm going to move along through the keep it simple setup flow to our outer E string height adjustments. So to do that, I'm going to use my string action gauge and I'm going to keep my pick capo in to hold down my low E string. So I'll be using uh, the string action gauge and uh, what's really cool, or actually a few things that are really cool about the Music Nomad string action gauge. Uh, one is it has a, a chart on either side, both in uh, inches and in millimeters, recommending a uh, string action settings for most common guitars. It has uh, the most common setting for electric, acoustic, and bass. And it also has uh, suggested deviations, both lower and higher action, uh, if you have a lighter attack or a heavier attack. Um, the common settings are ones that we have used for years in, like I said, thousands and thousands of setups. They're a very, very good place to start. Guitar would play great at those settings. Uh, but you know, you may have a little heavier attack or maybe a little li lighter attack and you might want a little you know, different action from those. Um, we also have on here a pickup height gauge, which is really cool. It's a little ruler that will allow you to uh, quickly and easily measure uh, the distance of the pickup from your string. So that simplifies that process pretty well. And uh, it's uh, also what I really like about it is it's white on black. So the contrast is really good. Uh, it's very easy to read. So the way that I'll use this gauge is I will put the uh, guitar in the playing position and I have the, again, the pick capo in, so I'm fretted at the first fret. And I'm going to use uh, the most common settings for electric guitar, which is 60 thousandths of an inch high on the low E string, 50 thousandths of an inch high on the high E string. Now that action height should allow for a good, clean playability at a reasonable pick attack. It's gonna be a nice, comfortable action. Uh, you should be able to bend cleanly. Um, you know, if you dig in really hard, you might get a little bit of fret buzz, but the note should ring out cleanly and it just is a good all around setting. So that's where we're going with this one. So to use the gauge, I'm going to put it behind the low E string and I'm looking for what line corresponds to the bottom of the string at the 12th fret. So looking at my gauge here, I can see that my 0 0.07 line is just sticking out from under the low E string. So that means that my low E string is 70 thousandths of an inch off of the 12th fret, which is 10 thousandths of an inch higher than what I want. So I will be adjusting that down. Now I'll fret my high E string at the first fret and measure behind the high E string. And I can see on that, it is sitting right on top of the 60 line, the 0 0.06 line. So that's about 10 thousandths higher than I want on the treble side. So I'm gonna lower that down as well. So this is a brand new guitar. And you can see by the measurements I just took, the factory setup is a little bit higher than we would like. And that's pretty typical across the board, whether you're looking at an acoustic guitar or an electric guitar, most manufacturers are going to set their action heights higher than is comfortable for most players. Now the reason for that is, is they want to avoid any fret buzz when they are played. So you go down to your local music store, you pick up a guitar and you play it. You may not be able to judge is the action high or low, but you definitely can hear fret buzz. So with the action set high, that's gonna minimize that potential. But that puts you in the position of buying a guitar and then needing to set it up. Because uh, if you have it set to have no fret buzz ever, the action is going to be very high and it's not going to be comfortable to play. So I've measured my action at 7060 and I want to be at 6050. So I need to get an Allen wrench to adjust my saddles down. Uh, this will probably be a 1.5 millimeter. So I've got my 1.5 millimeter Allen wrench uh, head from my Guitar Tech screwdriver set. And the Guitar Tech screwdriver set is really cool because it has a lot of different bits, both SAE and metric, 
to cover just about every screw, Allen head, uh, or nut that you would want to adjust on any guitar from your tuner bushings to saddle screws to your pit guard screws, uh, your pot nuts, the whole guitar can be adjusted with the bits that are included in that kit. Now for these saddles, I'm going to use the 1.5 millimeter Allen and that is correct. So what I'll do is I'm gonna back these screws out a little bit. You lower the saddles by loosening the screws. When you loosen the screws, the saddle moves down on the screws towards the bridge. So that lowers the action at the 12th fret. If you needed to raise the action, you would tighten the screws, turning them clockwise. That would raise the saddle up the adjustment screws and bring the string farther away from the frets. So I'm gonna back these out, maybe a half turn each. I only need to go down 10 thousandths of an inch, so it's not very far. But you would be surprised how big of a difference 10 thousandths of an inch makes in a guitar setup. It's um, really, uh, those minute measurements, they'll make the guitar play so much better. All right, so let's go back in and remeasure now. Okay, that's about 65. I can see a little gap above the 60 line. So I'm gonna go ahead and lower that down just a little bit further. There we go. I can see the 60 line just coming out from under the string. Now I'll fret back at the first fret on the high E and I'm about 55. I can see a little gap above the 50 line. So I'm gonna drop this down about another half turn. And there we go, it's sitting right on top of the 50 line. So now the action is exactly 60-50 on the outer E's. I'm gonna tune it back to pitch. Now I'll set my inner four strings using the radius gauge. Now I measured my fretboard radius at nine and a half when I had my strings off. So I'm going to use my nine and a half inch radius gauge to set the strings to exactly the same arc at the bridge as the arc of the fret. So what I've got when I put my nine and a half gauge on here, and I like to look down the guitar like so, I can really see the contact point between the gauge and the strings. It's very round, it's rocking in the middle. So the arc of the strings is much too round for the fretboard. So what I like to do if I find that all four strings in the middle are too high, I like to lower them all down below the gauge. Um, rather than trying to lower one at a time correctly, I just lower them all too much and then I bring them back up to the gauge. So I'm gonna just drop, drop my saddles down. So that what I'm gonna end up with is I'm gonna end up with the radius gauge sitting on the outer two E strings and all four of these strings are gonna to be too low. And then I will bring them up one at a time to contact the radius gauge. If you have trouble adjusting your saddles like I'm doing with the guitar in one hand and standing up, you know, feel free to lay it down. I mean, it's obviously more secure, so if you have any issues doing it that way, just lay it down on the, uh, lay it down on the bench because you don't wanna drop it. All right, so those are lowered down, I think enough to get below the gauge. Yes. So now whenever I set my radius gauge on my strings, it's only on the outer two E's. So I'm going to one at a time bring these strings up until they touch the gauge. When you're measuring your bridge radius, you wanna set the radius gauge about a quarter inch or a half inch in front of the bridge. So basically in between the saddles and the bridge pickup is a good point. Uh, you don't want it too close up to the neck because the strings are really springy, but you don't want it on the saddles because you might not get an accurate measurement. So just a little bit off the saddles is a good spot. Um, so I'm looking at this and all four of my strings are too low. So I'm going to raise up my strings one at a time until they contact the radius gauge. 
When you're raising or lowering your saddles or doing any saddle adjustment, you want to make sure that the saddle ends up parallel to the bridge base. You don't want it angled one direction or the other. Um, each saddle is its own individual little bridge and you want to have even contact with both screws. So make sure that the bottom of the bridge saddle is parallel to the bridge base. So now my A string is touching exactly. Uh, if you have trouble seeing if the string is touching the gauge or not, there's a couple of things you can do. One, you can set the gauge on the strings and you can gently bounce the gauge up and down. And you can look at each string and see what's moving and what isn't. So right now I can see if I bounce it up and down, my E and A are moving and my high E is moving, but my D, G, and B are not. Uh, another way that you can do it is you can gently push the, set the gauge on the strings and you can pluck each string and you can listen for the rattle. So you can hear the A is rattling, but the D is not. It's very low. G is not, B is not, but the E is. So I know that my B, G, and D are too low. And like the string action gauge, you know, a cool thing about the uh, the Music Nomad radius gauges is that they're black, so the contrast between the string and the gauge is really uh, stark, and you can see the gap between them a lot more easily than I think you can with a silver uh, silver gauge. So I've got my A string adjusted there. I'm going to bring up my D till it touches the gauge a little farther. Okay, right on the money. Let's bring up the G. Almost. It's perfect. Now I'll bring up the B. It's actually a little bit high. I could see it moving and my other strings were not when I was pushing it up and down. There we go. That's all six right on the gauge. So now that I've moved my saddles around, I'm going to uh, tune the guitar back to pitch. Um, one thing to keep in mind as you're adjusting your uh, saddle height and radius, if your spring tension is very low on your tremolo, if you raise your saddles up, you might find that the back of the tremolo has come off the body because you've raised the leverage point. So you might have to go back in and re-tighten your claw screws. Um, but you'll know if the back of the, uh, the tremolo has come up. So get this back into pitch. So now that the guitar has had the, uh, the truss rod set correctly, the bridge action and radius set, I'm going to give it a little bit of a playing test because I want to see, uh, will it play at this action? Maybe the guitar has some uneven frets or maybe my pick attack is heavier than I think and I, I just want to make sure that everything's going to work. So what I'll typically do is I'll go through and fret and play every note up and down the neck on all six strings. And then I, if you bend a lot, you're gonna to wanna to get on your high E and bend notes and see if they choke out. Like that one, you can get, you can get over a whole step, but then it dies. So for most players, that's gonna to be totally fine. If you are a really big bender, you might wanna raise up the action just a touch. I will bet you these, this guitar does not have perfect fret work. So uh, a fret level and dress would probably make this right, but at, as it stands right now, for most players, a whole step bend is more than enough. So I'm gonna leave it there. So as you heard with the, the big bends fretting out a little bit, but only on one or two notes, that means that the frets are uneven. So this guitar came from the factory with uneven fretwork. Um, that is very typical uh, for guitars from $100 Amazon kit guitars up to $6,000 custom shops. It is a case-by-case -case basis. Many, many, many guitars need fretwork right out of the factory.
So if you find that at the action height that is comfortable for you, you do have some fret buzz or some choking out, you may need to have some fret work done. So now that we have our truss rod set correctly, our action radius done, we're gonna move up to the nut. Um, the nut is really critical. It's just a little piece of plastic or bone, but it governs the intonation in the low registers, the, uh, the playability in the uh, low registers, uh, also tuning stability. You wanna make sure that your nut slots are cut correctly so the strings don't bind in them. So it's really important to pay attention to cutting your nut slots correctly, both the measuring process and then the final cutting. So we will first things first, get our nut height gauge which is uh, another cool gauge we have here. It's a feeler gauge set, just uh, very similar to the truss rod gauge, but this has uh, feeler gauges from 22 thousandths down to 12 thousandths, and they are marked on them uh, what strings on what type of instruments they're used for. So on this guitar, we're going to use the 20 thousandths gauge for our low E and A. We're gonna use the 18 thou gauge for our D and G and the 16 thou gauge for our B and E. Now, like the uh, truss rod gauge, we have the touch rule on here. As we measure this gap, if we have a heavy touch, meaning that the gauge touches the string and the fret both, maybe even moves the string out of the way, we know that the nut slot is definitely low enough. If it doesn't buzz, it's fine. But if it's so low that it buzzes, you might need to raise the slot by filling it, shimming the nut, or making a new nut. And that's the open string. If you pluck the open string and it buzzes, that means the slot is too low. If you put the gauge between and there's no touch, meaning that the string uh, leaves a gap between it and the gauge, you're gonna want to file the nut slots lower to lower the string above the first fret. So that's how you adjust the height of the string above the first fret is by actually filing the slot that the string sits in in the nut. So I know that this part of the setup, filing the nut slots can be a little bit daunting. You know, this is all the other adjustments we've done up to this point were just with screws and you know, you can, if you mess it up, you can just readjust, it's no big deal. And you might be thinking, ah, you know, what if I cut my nut slot too low? Well, you know, what's gonna happen? And there is that risk, but it's really not that hard. So if you are just careful and cautious and you take a little bit at a time, I'm confident that you can do it and I'm gonna show you how. Now I'll be using the uh, Music Nomad diamond coated nut files, which really makes the whole process a lot easier. You know, the grit is very even on the files and the files are perfectly round. So you're cutting the bottom of the string slot so that it perfectly cradles a string. With the evenness of the grit and the shape of the file itself, uh, you're, it's very easy to get a consistent cut so that you can make small steps as you bring your slots down to depth. Um, also, what's nice about them is they have a, a very rigid back so they don't bend or distort like some of the other small gauge files do. So the first thing I'm gonna do is measure my low E string gap. And I put my 20 gauge between my fret and my low E string and I definitely have a space. So I'm gonna wanna file that slot down to bring the string down over the first fret. So this guitar has a set of tens on it, which is a uh, very standard for an electric guitar. And the string gauges are 46, 36, 26, 17, 13, 10. Those are all in thousandths of an inch. You can find those measurements on your string pack. So after you've strung your guitar up to get it ready for the setup, hang on to your string pack. It'll make it easy for you to identify your string gauges so that you can get the correct files to cut the slots to depth. Now when you're picking your files, you want to go with either the same size file as the string. So let's pretend we're talking about the 46 thousandths low E. You want to use a 46 file, or you could use one a little bit bigger. You don't want to go about more than about four thousandths of an inch oversized. Um, if you use your tremolo a lot, you might want to go to the next size up just to make the slot a little bigger for ease of movement using your tremolo, help the tuning stability, but you know, really try to stick to the same size or just slightly oversized. So I have here my set for electric guitar, and this is going to be a, a set that's specifically for nines or tens. 
So if you play nines or tens, this set of files will work fine for those strings. Um, I'm gonna have a 46 for my low E, which is exact match, 36 for my A, which again is an exact match. I have a 28 for my D, which is two thousandths bigger than the D string, which is completely fine and within tolerance. Uh, I've got a 17 for my G, which is the same size, 13 for my B, and a 10 for my E. Those are all the same size files. So this is the correct set for this guitar. Uh, to use the files, what I like to do is I like to stand over the guitar like this so I can look down on the nut. So I know that I'm cutting in a straight line and I can see if I'm drifting my slot one direction or the other. Uh, you know, some folks, they try to get down on the side so they can see the angle, um, but I just find that doesn't work very well for me. So I'm gonna take the file, I'm gonna hold it like so, and I'm gonna file from above the nut like that. Now the handles are really comfortable, um, but the another cool thing about the files is if you are in a spot where you don't have very much clearance, you can pop the file out of the handle and you can just use the file by itself, which I do a lot of the time. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and pop that back into its handle. Um, the process here is you're gonna loosen your string going to pop it out of the slot, take the file, put it down into the string slot, and you're going to file down at a bit of an angle towards the tuner. Um, not a severe angle, but you are going to file at a little bit of an angle down so that the string slot is angled such that the string leaves the nut at the very front edge. That's really important. That uh, makes the string resonate more cleanly and it also uh, makes sure that the intonation from the nut to the first fret is correct. So always file down at an angle. With a Strat or a Squire Strat like this one, you have a shelf behind the nut and if you file at too severe of an angle, you can cut into that nut shelf. So be aware of that. Just you, All you need is just a little bit of an angle, a couple of degrees. So I'll take the file, put it in the nut slot like so, and I'm just gonna go back and forth a couple of times. Now I notice that I'm already making some dust here, so I have taken material off. There was dirt in the bottom of the nut slot, that is now gone, so I know I have removed material from the nut. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the string back in, tune it back to pitch, and I'm gonna double check with my 20 gauge. And that is right on the money. So that is perfect, didn't take much. So. That should be an example of, especially when you're beginning, just if you see any dust, if you notice that the dirt is gone from the bottom of the slot, just stop, put the string back in, double check. If you need to go a little more, go a little more, but don't go crazy right out of the gate until you have a feel for how the file's cut. So now I'm gonna measure my A string. And my A is right on the money. There is no need to cut that string down at all. It is uh, perfectly to height. So now I'll move over to my 18 for my D and G. So I'm still gonna come in under the A and E string and I'm lifting up a little bit to make sure that the end of the uh, feeler gauge stays down tight to the fret. All right, so that is moving the string a little bit. So I know that my D string is a little bit under spec. So what I'm gonna do is just check it and see if it buzzes open. And if it doesn't, I'm not really gonna worry about it being a little bit too low. Um, if it were so low that it were buzzing, then I would need to either fill the slot with you know, some baking soda super glue, or I could shim the nut up by removing the nut, putting some veneer under it, or I could make a new nut. But if it's not buzzing and it's not super, super low, I'm not gonna worry about it. Next up is my G. So I'm gonna come in from the treble side on this one. And the G is definitely too high, not by a ton, but it is definitely too high. So I am going to get my 17 file 
because that matches my string. It's another hot pro tip. Be sure you're using the right size file for the string that you're cutting. It's very easy to pick up the wrong file. Maybe you're using too small of a file for a bigger string. You're cutting and cutting and it, the string's not getting any lower and that's because you're cutting a little channel underneath it. Uh, also, you can uh, pick up too big of a file and you can make the slot too wide. So just make sure that you're using the right file for the string. So this uh, string goes underneath a string tree, which holds the string down to keep proper pressure on the nut. So I'm just gonna pop the string out of the tree and it's easy just to move it out of the way. I don't even really need to down tune it. So I'm gonna just pop it over and I'm gonna come in here right in the slot. And just give a good, good quick file. Pop it back into the tree. All right, so let's go ahead and measure the G now that I've cut it. Okay, it does move the string just a little bit. So I just want to see if my open string buzzes. And it does not, so I'm not going to worry about it. That's the one of the things that we thought about whenever we made these gauges is leaving just a little margin. Uh, so if you go a tiny bit below spec, you shouldn't run into any buzzing issues. Definitely better to try to hit it right on the money, but you do have a little bit of a safety margin there. So now I'll measure my B string. I'm going to come in under the E and I'll put that right there. And that is definitely too high. So I am going to get my 13 file. And just like the G, this is underneath a string tree. So I can pop it out and then I can just move it over to the G slot. Let's get my 13 file. Come in here and just give it a little bit of a cut there. And that is pretty much right on the money on that B. So now we'll do these the same, our 16 thousandths for our E string, which is definitely a bit high. So I'll pop uh, the E out of the string tree and just move it over into the B slot, get my 10 thou file to match the 10 thousandths of an inch string. Come in and give it a little Still has a bit of a gap, so I'm going to need to go a little bit more on that. And again, you know, with the file, just a nice light pressure, nice even stroke, and you know, you'll be able to go in a good controlled manner. I actually need to go one more time. Slow and steady wins the race. All right, I like that. That's right on the money. So now we have all the nut slots cut to depth. And, you know, I think you saw that, you know, even for a seasoned professional, if you're not careful, it is easy to go a little bit too far. So very light, light, even strokes, maybe three or four strokes, then recheck your string height. Um, and, you know, if you take it in a diligent and determined manner, you'll be able to get these, uh, get your nut slots exactly correct. Now, uh, Music Nomad uh, has Tune It, which is a string slot lubricant. So if you uh, use your tremolo a lot or you want a little extra added tuning stability uh, insurance, you can use a little bit of Tune It in each nut slot. But if you use the files, uh, the correct size for the strings, you should have no trouble with nut binding. Your strings should glide through the slots perfectly fine and you ha should have really good tuning stability. So at this point, we will uh, set our bridge intonation. Intonation is the adjustment of the saddles forward and backward that makes the fretted notes play in tune with the open strings. Now, I don't know about you, but I like my guitars to play in tune. So uh, you want to take your time and uh, you know really be careful with your intonation. Um, you can make your guitar play very well in tune all the way up the fretboard if you just just take the time to do it right. This is where it's really crucial that your guitar is right in tune. 
So I'm using a strobe tuner for this process, which is ideal. Um, if you have a headstock tuner or you know a tuner that's a little bit less quality, you can get close. Um, you and then you can bring it in by ear, but a strobe is really the best way to to really dial it in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my string perfectly in tune. So we'll get the open string perfectly in tune. And now I'm going to play the octave note at the 12th fret, not the harmonic, the fretted note. So this shows to be a little bit sharp. You can see the tuner is scrolling clockwise, which means that it's sharp. That means that the saddle adjustment is too far forward and making the scale length too short. If your fretted note is sharp, you need to move the saddle back. If your fretted note is flat, you need to move the saddle forward. And that's done by adjusting these screws on the back of the bridge that go into the saddle. So in order for me to make this note flatter, I'm going to turn the screw clockwise and I'm going to pull the saddle back. So I'll need a number one Phillips screw driver head from my tech screwdriver kit. Since I'm pulling the saddle back, I'm going to loosen the string a little bit just to give it a, to decrease the tension there. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to turn the screw clockwise to pull the saddle back. And on this, unlike the nut slots where it's like one little stroke and you recheck, you actually need to move the saddle a little bit to impact the intonation. So you might need to give it a turn or two to actually see the saddle move. Um, once I've done that, bring it back into the playing position, back to pitch. And that is right on the money. That is just about as good as you're ever going to get. Um, the strobe tuner is a bit of a blessing and a curse. You can really dial everything in with it, but also it can be hard to make it perfectly stop. So if you have your guitar intonated and it's just drifting just a little bit, you will never hear that. I mean, I would try to make it dead solid, but if you can't quite get every note to that point, you'll be fine. It'll, you won't ever hear it. Um, same thing on my A string. Going to move in here and get that as perfectly in tune as I can. It's very good. And that is in tune absolutely no problem. So I'll move on to the D. So there's that. And that is also very well in tune. There would be, well, it's a little bit flat. So I'm going to go ahead and move my saddle forward towards the nut to shorten the scale and sharpen that note. So I'm going to turn my screw here counterclockwise to move the saddle forward. Retune to pitch. And check my 12th fret. And now that is dead on the money. There is no, no adjustment needed at that point. Okay, move over to the G. Got that a little, bring that down just a bit. There we go. Okay, my G's a little bit sharp. Now I'm gonna pull the saddle back by turning the screw a little bit clockwise. There we go, that's right. If you intonate correctly at the 12th fret, you may find that notes on up the neck can be a little bit sharp or a little bit flat. So depending on where you play up and down the neck, you might want to optimize for a certain area, or you might have to split the difference to make the overall intonation as best as it can be. So one way that you can verify or check if you play up higher is you can check your 12th fret, and then you can move up and check your 17th fret. 
and see if it is also in tune. This guitar it is. So this guitar has very even intonation all the way up the neck. Some guitars though, you'll set your 12th perfect and you'll be sharp up here. So you may wanna uh, you know, split the difference depending on where on the neck you play. Now on to the B string. Get that right in tune. There we go. A little bit sharp and I can check it up higher too. Just if I wanna check, make sure when I play in my Ingve leads, I'm in tune up there. It's definitely sharp higher up as well. So I'm gonna pull the saddle back to lengthen the scale and flatten that note a little bit. Perfect. Perfect. Now E string. These are all pretty close, so it's not a lot of saddle movement on them. You may find a guitar that, uh, you know, the saddles have been really put out of adjustment and you might have to do some back and forth to get it exactly right, but this has been pretty straightforward. So that's really good open. It's right on the money at the 12th. It's right, at the, right on the money at the 17th as well. So the final check you can do is uh, you can check octaves and just listen for any beating or weird sounding intervals, you know, because as, as good as a strobe tuner is and everything, I mean, definitely, you know, don't ignore your ear. If it sounds like it's a little bit out, uh, if you play an octave, you can check each note individually and see you know, which one is, is out and you can move the saddle to compensate for that. Um, and one thing that just happened on this guitar and be aware, after you've done all your intonation, if you do want to go in and check with by ear, make sure your open strings are in tune. Um, this low E had drifted a little bit and so that octave sounded funky, but it wasn't the intonation, it was actually the open string that had gone out of tune. So when you're checking your intonation, make certain that your open strings are perfectly tuned. Now we've made it all the way through the playability uh, setup on the guitar. Neck relief, bridge action, uh, height, and radius. Uh, we've cut the nut slots correctly and we've set the intonation. So this guitar plays super comfortably, very cleanly. It's in tune, it's gonna stay in tune. So the last step we have is to set our pickup heights. So uh, one of the good things about the uh, Music Nomad setup guide is it has uh, pickup specs for uh, most common guitars and pickup types. So here we have our uh, Stratocaster. We've got uh, three 30 seconds of an inch away from the strings on the bass side and one sixteenth of an inch away from the strings on the treble side. So to measure that, I'm going to use my pickup height gauge on the bottom of my string action gauge. And this thing's cool because it measures uh, both in 30 seconds and 16 So you have the ability to really dial in that height. So uh, we'll go for, again, we're going to go for a 16 of an inch on the um, treble side and 3 30 seconds on the bass side. Um, the reason for that is, is the thicker uh, bass string uh, often will uh, have a louder output than the treble string, so the bass side is a little bit lower than the treble side for even output. Now, once you get it set to that, you're gonna wanna listen to it, and if you know one side sounds higher than the other, you lower it. You know, if one side sounds too low, you raise it. So it's always an ear operation at the end, but this is gonna get you right into the right, right spot. So I'm gonna measure way too low because <clears throat> I lowered the pickups at the beginning of the setup. Bring those up. So now I'll fret at the last fret and I'm gonna measure, that is just a little too high now. So that is 330 seconds on the bass side. And that is 1 16th on the treble. That's my bridge pickup. I'll do the same thing on the middle pickup now. It's way too low. And 
you want to measure on the pole piece, not on the pickup cover, because um, the pickup cover is a little bit lower than the poles. So I'm going to bring that up just a bit more. base side a little high. That should do it. Yep, 3 30 seconds, 1 16 And last but not least, neck pickup. That is right. So now we'll plug it in and give it a listen. So to check the pickup output by ear, I'll put it in the bridge pickup position first, and I will check just with some chords mid-neck to see how even my output is from string to string. <laughs> I think that the treble is a little bit hot. I'm gonna lower that down just a bit and bring that bass side up just a bit. That sounds much more even to my ear. So now I will check the bridge pickup versus the middle pickup for overall output. So, bridge, middle, bridge, sound very even. So now I'll check my string to string for the middle pickup. It sounds very even across the strings. So last step, middle pickup versus neck pickup. So again, I'm just trying to balance the output from pickup to pickup. So when I switch from you know, bridge position and neck position and middle position, I don't have big volume differentials. So here's our middle, neck. The neck's a little louder. So I'm gonna drop that down just a bit. That sounds very good between the neck and the middle. So now I can just check all three. Neck. Middle. Bridge. Very even. They're gonna have different tonalities. The bridge pickup sounds much brighter and much less bassy than the neck pickup. So you'll have to kind of de make the determination, am I hearing a volume difference or am I hearing a frequency response difference? But uh, these pickups, volume-wise are very even across all three. So congratulations, you made it all the way through a Squire Strat setup. Uh, you know, again, just recapping, adjusted our truss rod, set our bridge, action height, and radius, adjusted our tremolo setting, cut the nut slots correctly, set the intonation, and lastly, set our pickups. So now if, uh, now this guitar is going to have the same playability as an American Strat, as a much more expensive guitar. You have gone through and set everything accurately. So, you know, your Squire is going to play amazingly well and punch well above its weight um, just by you taking a little bit of time uh, and making it play right. So as you can see, the Keep It Simple setup process, there's a lot of thought that's gone into it, both the process itself and the tools. So hopefully with the help of this video and the accuracy of the measuring tools and all of the adjustment tools, you'll be able to make your Squire play and sound great. So thanks so much for watching. For more videos on how to perform guitar setups or care for your frets, subscribe to our channel and visit musicnomadcare.com for all our products and how-to videos.